Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Grant Cameron. It's uh, morning here in Canada and it is afternoon in Sweden. I'm talking to Klaus Son uh, from the archives. I was there a couple of years ago. This is the biggest, I think the biggest um, archives of paranormal and UFO material in the world. Is that correct, Klaus? That is correct, Grant. Yeah. And it was uh, going from uh, building to building. And uh, uh, the only problem I had was um, I didn't have enough time to actually look at anything. We were, <laughs> we were actually taped it. It's on my internet, uh, my YouTube channel. I have, actually have the, the tour that we did. We taped as we went from building to building. I remember there was one particular thing. There was a, um, somebody put a bunch of articles together on MJ-12 and I wanted to stop. And, and I was looking at it and people say, come on, let's go, let's go. <laughs> So good morning, Klaus. I'm, I'm glad you um, could join me. I want to talk about um, a couple of different issues with you this morning. Uh, I want to get you to gain, go through uh, what you guys do there. And um, I understand a, a collection of Canadian material has, um, I don't know if it has arrived yet, but you have a co collection of Canadian material that very much interested me. And I want to talk about two uh, issues that um, are European issues. The Foo Fighter issue that I think you guys have some files on, and particularly what the reason I contacted you was because of the uh, Swedish uh, ghost rockets, which I've seen some interviews where people are talking crazy stuff about it and trying to move it into the Tic Tac, like they look like Tic Tacs and stuff. And I think you have all the files. I think you guys are the experts on this. So I wanted to ask you about that. So um, again, good morning and thank you for uh, joining me today. Nice to be with you. I'm looking forward to this. Beautiful. Um, okay, let's start with um, the archives. Can you basically describe what you have? And um, I, I guess with the COVID thing, it's a little bit shut down now, but um, what kind of material do you have there in terms of volume and numbers? Yeah, as you indicated, you had been walking through locality after locality. Yeah. You really would love to have everything under one roof, but as it is, for us right now. We have 15 different localities, basically around the same block. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's because it's a little cheaper for us to rent just another one, uh, mostly basement facility yeah. from time to time. So we started in 1973. And since that, we have expanded from just a couple of bookshelves to this uh, more than 6,500 square feet big lo locality. Wow. So it's, uh, we just got the fifth number 15 uh, a couple of months ago. And now we are, uh, uh, we have been, been collecting money through donations to buy mobile shelves. So we can really, really use this area as, uh, as uh, best we can, really. Uh, we have 2,500 yards of bookshelf. I think it may be 3,000 now with those mobile and around 55,000 books in the library and around say 100,000 magazines, some uh, between 60 and 70,000 UFO files. And uh, also as you indicated, this is not just a UFO facility anymore. We started out as being just for UFO reports. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when time goes on, you realize that it's so much else that really is connected to the phenomena. And it's also so much else that are of interest for us and for other researchers. We are a truly Fortean and paranormal archive as well nowadays. And we have hundreds and hundreds of films, thousands and thousands of pictures. I mean, you can name it. It's there. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. And then... And do you work there like full time or what's, what's your position there? Well, I'm a journalist with the Sweden's largest newspaper. So that is uh, my, uh, my day work. Okay. Uh, I'm chairman for Archives for the Unexplained, AFU, as we are called. Yeah. And uh, that is a foundation. We have a small board that uh, makes this uh, enterprise uh, go forward every day, I should say. And a lot of people are working there on the free time. But we also have, have uh, people from the unemployment agency uh, coming there and they are pay paying maybe 80% of their salaries and we are paying the rest. 
So every month we, we are uh, putting into this enterprise around 2,000 US dollars, something like that, maybe 2,500 US dollars. Yeah. And that is uh, put there by uh, ourselves and around 50 people, mostly Swedes and uh, a few uh, from abroad that are doing this to keep IFU uh, up and running. And uh, we are doing well. So it's no, no problem at all for, to run in this. Wow. And, and you, you mentioned two things. Uh, first is the, the idea that the Swedish government is actually helping you a little bit in terms of hiring these, these people who do a lot of work. I saw them working there. And it's like, so you're digitizing a lot of uh, audio tapes from the old days and stuff like that. And you have these people who do this all day long there. Absolutely, and uh, we have so much unique material. I can just mention that we got uh, maybe 100 reel-to-reel -reel tapes from the US um, 15 years ago, something like that. Wow. That was original report, original tape interviews with Daniel Fry, George Adamski, or Fio Angelucci, all those 1950s uh, contactees. And wow. uh, we have digitized them, they are now available. But some of the tapes were just falling to pieces when we opened them. Yeah. Uh, but we saved 95% of the material, I should say. And we are scanning, scanning, digitizing all the time. And we are making available on a download page. So you can go there to AFU downloads and you can read uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of UFO magazines from all around the world that we have made uh, uh, available through uh, context with, with the publishers. Wow, that, that, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, that's very impressive. What are some of the big collections that you've got from, you mentioned some of the contactees from the 1950s. Do you have any very famous collections? I think you had one very famous uh, ghost or paranormal collection I think I was seeing there. I mean, we have uh, Hillary Evans collection yeah, from, from yeah. the UK. Yeah. Uh, we have his entire uh, library and his entire files and that is uh, uh, as you say this is truly a paranormal fantastic archive with with the correspondence and his investigations and uh, his tapes and his manuscripts to books and uh, around 9000 of his books from the 1700 up to now uh, mostly into ghosts and uh, virgin mary uh, apparitions, things like that. So it's, it's, it's fantastic, really. It's so wonderful. I, I knew Hillary for many, many years, and I always stayed with him in London when I traveled to London. And when yeah. before he passed away, he donated all of this to us. Wow. And, and you mentioned that you're a journalist for the uh, biggest newspaper. What, what's the situation with uh, journalism there in terms of paranormal do the Swedish newspapers handle this kind of stuff and how have they handled the big story in the United States with the disclosure and the the Senate and all that kind of stuff well I have been writing a lot about that for my newspaper and I will probably go to the US uh, this summer and uh, do some more interviews and uh, and research so it's uh, it's no problem I can write whatever I want and we have covered the, the happenings in the US very much in detail. I just finished an interview with uh, Tom DeLong uh, oh. from uh, To The Stars wow. Academy. Is that right? Tell me about that. Yeah, it's not published yet, but I had a 45 minutes uh, talk with Tom. And uh, that will be published in, in uh, our Dagens Nyheter, which is the name of, of our newspaper that mm -hmm. I work with. And he told me about the work he's doing now with the army, about those uh, strange uh, metallic debris that uh, may emanate yeah. from from Roswell, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are talking about that. We're talking about the TTSA's future and what they are dealing with now. And they, of course, have turned much into working with uh, with uh, films, feature films um, connected to UFOs or, or the paranormal. Yeah. So th wow. that is uh, really, I, I should mention another large archive, uh, Wendell Stevens' files. Oh. We have at least uh, 35 or 40 percent of his files. Uh, at AFU, but they were scattered when he passed away. Yeah. So they are in different places, but we were able to secure uh, a large part of Wendell Stevens' uh, files. It was two huge pallets that came to Sweden 
from, from the US. Wow. And uh, we also have those fantastic files from William Corliss with the source book project. William Corliss was a, a NASA uh, phys uh, physicist and he worked with uh, uh, strange, unusual happenings in nature. And he published so many books about them. And uh, when he passed away, we were able to secure his, his files as well. Wow, uh, that, that's absolutely fascinating. You mentioned Tom DeLong. I know that there's a photograph that I've published a couple of times where Jim Semivan was came to actually to your archives to visit. Yeah, that's right. He, yeah. he, I'm a friend with Jim and I, I told him about AFU and we gave him a tour and he stayed for a couple of days. So, uh, yeah. How, how many people do you have uh, researching at any one time there? Do you have, with COVID, I guess it's down, but do you have people from all around the world coming there to look at stuff? Absolutely. Mostly Europeans, of course, are coming, European researchers. But we also have had uh, a couple of people coming from the US, mostly historians. Yeah. Uh, and we also had a Japanese guy who flew in from Tokyo for three days just to take a look at our Japanese files. Oh, yeah. uh, so that tells a little about uh, what we have. We have one of the best files from, from Russia uh, when it comes to books and when it comes to, to uh, UFO reports. I went to Moscow in the early 90s yeah. and uh, were able to secure copies of the KGB files. Uh, I was also able to, uh, to bring back 1,100 original Russian UFO reports. And we have loads of, uh, of books in Russian. And we are keeping in touch with Russian researchers, of course as we deal with researchers all over the world. Yeah, I know. I noticed that you have a number of collections from sort of, um, like I think you had a, a room that was just Spanish stuff uh, from Spain. Yeah, so you right. have, uh, that's what people got to realize. You, you guys have literally uh, collections in different languages and um, it's, it's all so carefully organized and arranged and stuff like that. And uh, you have some of the, the best stuff I'd seen around in terms of, I think they were just, archiving some of the stuff from from the early contactees which is is stuff that um has sort of been forgotten in, in ufology but when you look at it there was a lot of material produced during that period of time i mean there the whole history of ufology is really a day of you right now you can find so much i traveled to britain i mean covid has made some yeah. problems with that but usually i travel to britain once or twice every year yeah and uh I know, I think every British researcher, and we have been saving files and stuff from attics, from basements, from whatever you would like to think, yeah. from, from the garbage, really. So we also saved the flying saucer review files when uh, Gordon Creighton passed oh, yeah. away. Yeah. And uh, we have that uh, at AFU right now. And, you know, the British uh, Bufora, British UFO Research Association, yeah. the largest uh, body in, in Britain. Uh, we, I have assembled their entire files by traveling through Britain for 10 years from every, every corner of Britain. And when they were having their 50th anniversary, anniversary, I could give them a two terabyte hard drive with all their stuff scanned with their film clips, their audio tapes, their magazines, uh, and all their files. <laughs> <laughs> this is an amazing story that I'm, I'm, I'm sad that people don't really know more about this, but it's just an amazing place, an amazing amount of material that you guys have, uh, have, have uh, done there. Uh, let's go to the, um, the idea of the, the Canadian collection. You've got a bunch of stuff that I noticed when I was looking up um, to do this interview that you've got a bunch of Canadian stuff. Can you talk about that stuff that just come in there, a whole pallet full of stuff? Yeah, I, I wish I'd know more. I will be traveling to AFU. I'm living in Stockholm. Yeah. I'm traveling to AFU south of Stockholm on Tuesday because it arrived just uh, two days ago. Oh, okay, okay. From uh, Toronto. And it was uh, ufologist uh, Drew Williamson who helped us to assemble this. He saved many files around uh, Canada and uh, we made an arrangement with him and he packed the... It's one, it's two pallets, I think, two pallets altogether wow. that arrived now. So I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I'm not really sure what's, what's in it yet, but I know it's uh, from many, many different uh, Canadian researchers. Yeah. Uh, it's books and it's files and it's uh, everything you, you would like from tapes to pictures, of course. 
So uh, I hope I will be writing about this at afu.se, which is our web page. So uh, please take a look there. Yeah. Uh, in, in a week or so, there will be much more to know about it. Okay. It is wonderful. We have so little from Canada before. Yeah. So this was uh, really, really fantastic. Uh, well, I'll have to give you a copy of my collection. I've got the Canadian collection. I got Stanton stuff. I've got um, a lot of stuff. There's, um, in fact, I'm putting together something I want to send to you guys. Uh, the first uh, abductee before Betty and Barney Hill. There's been two books written on her. Uh, all the tapes, she had all the tapes of the police officers and the regressions and stuff like that. So I, I'd like to help you guys out. If I come to Sweden, is there a place, do you have an arrangement where people uh, can rent a place? And um, because, you know, it's a foreign language and stuff like that. What, what do you, do you have any arrangements to help researchers to operate once you're in Sweden? Yes, uh, we have an arrangement with uh, a hotel that is, uh, is cheap and good. You, you can stay and we are very open to, to help people. We are always helping people. That is the idea of AFU. Yeah. We are of course doing this for saving, but it's not just to put it on, on bookshelves. We are wanting to we want to help people, to help researchers. We are very, very open to, to help anyone, really. Anyone. Yeah, because it, it, it's just a, <laughs> just an amazing place, especially for a researcher, because that's I do the same sort of thing. We you, you probably do the same thing as your researcher, you're gathering material, you're when you see something you haven't seen before, you want to see what did they know? It's like you're dealing with people's private material material and they may have something, a story they've never told before or it's in their files that they didn't publish it. And so it's a, it's a gold mine for anybody who's into uh, research and trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, as you mentioned there, it's private material. It's very much that it's sensitive, of course. We cannot just publish anything yeah. uh, like that. We must uh, delete names uh, from time to time. And uh, you know that. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> we are always getting questions. <clears throat> Why don't you publish everything online? <laughs> it's not that easy. It's not that easy. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you when you get the the audio and the videotape. I mean, that's a lot of material that you're 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 producing there, and people have no idea. I mean, this is like it's just it's just amazing if you look at the video that I have when I go through these rooms. I mean, it's just bookshop after like it's behind you like times thousands, and just yeah. amazing and all cataloged and stuff like that. That that you you could a researcher could spend years there, and you know. You never come to an end for anything. It's just an amazing, amazing amount of material and, and that you guys have collected all this material. It, it's just absolutely stunning that, what about the Adamski collection? I think there was some discussion that you guys were trying to get part of the Adamski collection. Do you have that yeah. as one of the big collections? We, we are, we're still discussing that, but uh, it's not very easy. Yeah. I can't go into that really. It's, it's yeah. uh, Things are not easy when it comes to, <laughs> to getting files from, from people, but we are really, really want to, to, to save that hugely important material. I mean, that is history. Yeah. It's so important. Uh, I really hope we can do that. And yeah. we have so many other people around the world that we are discussing with all the time, trying to make them understand that, you know, the day that they are passing, yeah. Yeah. someone will come there empty their bookshelves, empty their files, and throw it yeah. in yeah. the bin, really. Yeah. That happens. Yeah, that's, that's what I always point out to people as well, is number one, record your story, because you're a part of a very historic thing that's happening in the world. And secondly, the fact that most people, their families, you know, they tolerate, they're, they they will go along it, but they're really not that interested, like, like oh. whatever triggered us. And I know with with mine, I mean, nobody in my family is really interested in 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 saving the stuff. So you have to make sure that you you for, for, you know uh, gather. You spend your whole life gathering this material, yeah. And um, the, the, if we put it together with your material, and uh, it's just a, um, a a wonderful place that people should consider putting their material. I know Rice University is gathering material, but it's not even close to what you guys have. I mean, it's just- it's I will go there in March. I will go to Rice University and, and give a talk about AFU at the wow. conference. There. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And the other the other place that has collections, I think we have 50 collections here at the University of Manitoba, and it's mostly um, um, paranormal stuff, like uh, life after death and stuff like that. There's some collections here, but uh, 
you know, where you with yours, you have everything in one place because like the Staten files, when I went to look at the Staten files or, you know, the presidential files where you go to presidential libraries. I mean, they, I, there's probably in, in one or two people that do this kind of stuff because it's very expensive to travel around and to gather material. Yes. And if you have it all in sort of one place, you can, it may cost you some money, but you have piles and piles of collections. If you really want to get to the bottom of one particular story, you guys have the vast majority of material. I've been helping out with the Stanton Friedman files. I've been uh, uh, a so-called expert uh, helping out with, with how they should uh, organize it. Oh, okay, yeah, they're, because that, that was the thing, I, when I talked to the archivist there, they, they had this, this thing is that the Stanton Friedman collection, people don't realize he lived in, in Canada in Fredericton, but um, this archives doesn't do UFO stuff. It doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. It was no. just that Stanton was so, so famous that they decided <laughs> to try to get the collection. And so they got this collection of you know, rooms and rooms and rooms of material, but they had no idea what to do. They had no, they had, didn't know, they had to learn they, who are the names. I had to tell them, okay, watch for these names and stuff like that. And then they wanted to know, what do we do with these little pieces of paper that are there and stuff. They, they were over their heads in terms of trying to figure out uh, how to deal yeah. it. And a lot of stuff, Stan, Stan stuff wasn't really sorted, which people don't realize either. It was all out of boxes. So they have to go piece by piece through these pieces of paper. People who aren't into ufology, maybe will now learn a little bit about it, but they have to archives. I think, I don't know, I can't remember, they had four people working on it, but it was, it was just a massive job that's gonna take years. So I'm glad you're helping them out in terms of uh, getting this material all organized. As you say, they don't really understand what they are dealing with. <laughs> they are learning yeah. by, by, by doing it, but uh, it's a long way. It's much easier for us. I mean, at AFU, we know. We know the people, we know the, 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 the phenomena, and we know everything, really. So we can, we can do this easily. It's much more problematic for university that's never, never turned uh, their attention to UFOs before. Yeah. Uh, I should mention that we can, we're also selling Books because we keep we keep two copies of every book we we have uh, in, in our bookshelves. The third copy we are selling to AFU bookshop. Yeah. So there you can find uh, books and magazines that you have been looking for. So please take a look there, and uh, all the money that goes into there goes to AFU. Yeah, yeah. I got I got a couple of books from the uh, Mission Rama, the early Mission Rama, the the book, the original book that was written about uh, the reporter that went to Peru. It's in Spanish. I haven't read it yet because I don't really speak Spanish, but um, that's the thing is you do have a lot of these books that you can't find anywhere else that are, you know, very sort of rare, rare, rare books. And you have that whole room full of books that, are, that people can buy that are um, almost like collector items. Yeah, and we also sell a book about ourselves. Wow, time. okay. I'll put links for this, this material. Wow. This yeah, I do cool. that. Files of the Unexplained, which I wrote a couple of years ago. And that gives you uh, a glimpse about what AFU really deals with. So please take a look at that if you want. And uh, it's available on the AFU uh, shop as well. What would be the prize of your collection? What would be the, one of the things that you really think is, um, you know, a, a collection that's extremely, you know, hard to get or um, that people really don't know you have? Or maybe there's a couple of collections that people should be aware of. Well, we have, of course, uh, if you take just one single piece, I should mention uh, the British uh, policeman, Alan Godfrey's police jacket, which he was wearing when he was abducted, wow. the first uh, police abductee in, in uh, the UK. We have his jacket, which is nice, of course. We have lots of pieces that people have found in connection with the UFO sightings, which they at that time thought were something very, very strange. Some are analyzed, some are not. Uh, I have a hair from uh, Bigfoot uh, in there. Wow. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Uh, but uh, it's so, so much. It's very hard to pinpoint anything. It's the sheer volume. Uh, that's uh, the most important, really, I should say. But this old, those old audio tapes and old film clips. I mean, I went to Eureka in California uh, a couple of years ago and saved a collection from the 1940s. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the BSRA collection that oh, yeah, was yeah. kept there. It took us years to, to make that happen. 
uh, happen. We, we made telephone calls, we wrote letters, we wrote emails, but we never got in contact with the man who had saved all those files. But one night he did answer me. And uh, after that, I traveled there and we assembled all of those stuff from the 1940s, 50s, up into 60s and 70s. And they are now at AFU. And that is uh, really, truly a fantastic archive. Wow, a absolutely fantastic. Okay, let's go to the, the, the two items that I want to discuss. The one is the Foo Fighter uh, material. So you have, uh, what, what's your opinion on this? Because uh, what I see is happening now in, in the world is when people haven't really read the material, they're sort of trying to make everything into Tic Tacs, everything fits into what they're, what's happening in the United States. Well, what's your take on the Foo Fighter and what kind of material do you have from, from these sightings from World War II? Yeah, we, we do have uh, copies of letters from uh, air, crew, air crew that were meeting those strange, often illuminated balls of light or sometimes disc-shaped small objects. Uh, we have saved some of those stuff from England from, from meetings with the British UFO researchers. Um, I wish we had more because I, I knew about the collection in Britain and that we didn't, we didn't uh, get our hands on. It disappeared and nobody really knows where, where it ended up today. But it's one of the most strange phenomena I came across really. It's really good material. Uh, observations written down after uh, the air crew had returned to their base in Britain. It could be British, could be, be American air crews. And uh, reading that, reading those letters, reading those uh, reports, really makes you feel that this was so strange that it was not the typical Nazi German weapon. It was something else than that. Yeah. And it was, and would you can agree with me that it wasn't like like regular UFO sightings? That it was more like balls of light and small things that people were reporting. It wasn't like the classic saucer that was flying around and stuff like that. No, no, it wasn't. You're right about that. It's a it's a phenomenon in itself, really. It's something that has not repeated itself after that. Yeah, that happened. That that, that was unique in in, in the words to the true meaning. Yeah, it's almost like the phenomena is is sort of morphs, it changes from one thing to another because you have that and then you have the ghost rockets. So the ghost rockets, I have um, one guy I did an interview with, um, former U.S. Air Force, a Canadian Air Force guy that was um, held in one of the camps uh, in Europe. And um, he has a sighting of, of this, what he did basically describes as a, a rocket going across the sky and everybody's watching this thing. But the talk a little bit about what you have with the ghost rockets and, and maybe go through a little bit about what was going on. Because I remember when I was there, it was pointed out to me that they were going into swamps. Can you go through that whole thing about what was going on? And that this is still going on, I believe. It's like this, it didn't just happen in one year, right? No, that's right, Grant. It didn't stop. It started in 1946. Yeah. I mean, the year after the Second World War ended. And at that time, there were really no no military activity going on in Europe because everyone was consolidating. They were bringing stuff from Germany into Russia and back to the US and back to the UK, but nobody was uh, shooting missiles at that time. In spite of that, people in Sweden, Norway and uh, Finland and partly in Denmark did report missile shaped objects like cigars, <clears throat> sometimes with small wings, sometimes without wings at all, flying through the sky in clear daylight. And as you said, some of those were crashing. They were diving into lakes in Sweden and in Finland and in Norway. There were so many crashes. Uh, we got our hands on, on the Swedish military's uh, secret files in 19, early 1980s, I think to say, yeah. And there you could see at 100 reports of crashes had been logged by the Swedish military, and all of them into lakes, no one on land, which is, of course, strange if it was just some haphazard thing happening. So someone was shooting, shooting those rockets, aiming for 
for the lakes. And in the early 1980s, I traveled around Sweden. I interviewed so many eyewitnesses and they are nearly all gone now. Yeah. But, uh, and I also interviewed the Swedish military, uh, that uh, uh, the, the top researchers there. And they told me that they never really got to know what or who were behind this. They thought, of course, that it was the Russians, which we always think yeah. here in Sweden. And yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. we are right. We are not always right about that. Uh, and I interviewed Swedish fighter pilots that were trying to uh, intercept ghost rockets over Sweden, but they were outflown by, by the rockets. So it's, uh, to me, it's uh, maybe the biggest UFO enigma I can think of. It's so many witnesses, daylight, they could hear it. They could see the sun uh, shining in the hull. They could hear the crashes. They saw the splashes from, from the water. And the military, for half a year, did everything they could to try to find an answer. So it's really, really very much hands-on. That happened. And it was really something that nobody understood at that time. And not at this time either, I should say. Wow. Yeah. And, and so, But they did look like rockets, correct? They, did, they weren't really like the classic saucers. They looked more like, like rockets. Like going yeah and at that time i guess nobody had really seen a rocket so it was still very unusual but they I mean, did look yeah both both ways i mean there were the v2 and v1 rockets yeah, in, in and, and they did they did crash in sweden in 1944 1945 some of them were crashing in the sea in the baltic sea yeah. and they were found near the shore so they knew that there were rocket like things that could fly but this didn't look at all like the V bombs because they were flying over distances that the V bombs couldn't couldn't fly. It was really ten times as long as they were were built to fly. Yeah, and and when when was the latest one? When was the last sighting that you have recorded for uh, rockets? Just a couple of years ago, I should say. It's been less and less in the two thousands, but in the nineteen forties, fifties. 60s, 70s, 80s, it was still quite many reports, uh, this one every year, and they still crashes. And uh, in 1980, uh, it, crashed, it crashed some very, very strange ghost rocket in the very north of Sweden. So uh, in, 2000, in the 2012, I think, we, we, we started an expedition to that lake, and we uh, tried to find this object, and we did get the radar return oh, is uh, right? from, uh, from an object that is resting in the mud on, on the seafloor. Uh, and we have been there twice. Uh, we will go there again with a new instrument because this is a, a secure natural forest area, so we cannot do whatever we want. We must have permissions, but we have got permissions this far. But if we do find something, we cannot just bring it up because then you must have quite another permission to do that. Uh, but the two very big, two very good eyewitnesses that saw this rocket come flying over them in broad daylight, turning 180 degrees, flying towards them again, landing on the, on the lake, sinking. And we brought them with us. But the, the, the first expedition, so we could pinpoint exactly where to look. And then we started with divers and we started with those uh, special instruments and we got this radar return that we are very, very curious to, to really find what caused it. Wow, uh, how many books have been written on the phenomena? Have, have they people written about it? Uh, the only book that has been written about the ghost rockets uh, is a is part of a book that I wrote a couple of years ago. There are no single books about the ghost rocket uh, phenomena, which is a little strange because to me, this is the biggest UFO mystery in the world, really. Uh, and I, I'm planning to write a book. <laughs> Maybe when I'm retiring in a couple of years, I will do that. I hope I can wow. do that. <laughs> wow, yeah, because it is a, a very unique story that modern ufology is sort of they're on to other things, but you know, for people who've been around for a long time, you know that this, it's almost like unique, it's like your Roswell story for, for there. Go ahead. 
It's an ongoing Rosvall story, really. And you can see we have pictures from when the Swedish military were there looking wow. for the ghost rocket in, the, in 1946. Wow. Uh, wow. And uh, I met with the guy on this raft. He was the head of the investigation in Lake Kölmjärv in the very north of Sweden. And he told me that they were there for weeks and weeks. And all they found were an indentation in the bottom of the lake. They found water lilies cut off. They found stones were thrown up on the shore after this rocket crashed in front of the whole village in broad daylight. Wow. Uh, I'm, that's unbelievable. Uh, wh what about the Swedish government? Have you had conversations with them as to w what their take is? Are they doing uh, any sort of research or are they, do they have files? Have you gotten their files on UFOs and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they scanned all their files for, for me. I asked them to do that and they put uh, a person for three and a half months wow. to scan yeah. everything. And uh, then I met with them and they turned it over on a one terabyte hard drive. So we got it all. Uh, we got uh, also the ghost rocket files, the ghost flyer files, which were in the 1930s, another UFO talk, talk about that. I'm not familiar with that. What was that about? Yeah, it was really in the, in the early 1930s, people in the north of Sweden and north of Finland and north of Norway did see strange aircraft flying in... Uh, snowstorm in, in the darkness in very very bad weather they heard the, the sound from those objects and they thought they were of course uh, aircraft from uh, from russia that were spying over over the north of scandinavia and they sent aircraft up to the north of sweden trying to to chase those mysterious airplanes but they never succeeded to do that uh, they were, there were thousands of observations during several years in the 1930s. And the politicians in Sweden really, really wanted to, 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 uh, to find the answer because they thought it was the Russians, of course. But they never did. They never found it. Wow. Is, is the American story pretty big there in terms of what's going on in the United States, in terms of... Uh say people in Sweden do they are they do they follow this kind of stuff and how much Absolutely. how much is. Did, did, is there a lot of material um like in terms of newspapers and articles in Sweden where where people are, are they on the internet like I guess everybody else yeah it, last summer when the report uh, came uh, and uh, I mean the, the UAP task yeah. force report when that were published uh, in Sweden as well as other countries, it was written loads about it. I were, I were in, interviewed in TV, radio, uh, newspapers uh, for uh, weeks. Wow! And I also wrote a lot uh, myself. And I interviewed Luis Elizondo in the early 2018. Made a long interview with him. And uh, I, I think Swedes are very much uh, interested in what's happen, happening in the US. And when it comes to UFOs, this is the biggest story here in Sweden as well. Wow. No, any interest from governments or, say, the American Congress or people like Elizondo and stuff like that to uh, look at your material? Have you gotten interest from sort of outside uh, agencies like that that are, that are claiming that they're trying to figure out what's going on? No. Not really. I've been in contact with uh, To The Stars Academy and we had a cooperation uh, with them. They promoted our book and we have uh, good contacts with them. But when it comes to the, the military, uh, we have not heard anything from, from the US. And uh, the Swedish military, uh, I mean, they turned over their files to us to say, I mean, they are not that interested. They say to me that there are no UFO reports made by Swedish Air Force pilots during the last twenty years. Wow, In interesting. Because to me, to me, anybody who's seen your collection of material would know that if you're a researcher, a real honest researcher, and trying to figure out what's going on, you're not going to spend your time trying to find some UFO sighting. Uh, you could go there and spend two months at your place and learn more than you could possibly learn in any major government investigation because you guys just have so much material and so much. Um, almost, I would say probably almost every 
major UFO story or you've got books on it, you've got files that you yeah. collect the stuff in from all these different countries. It's just a massive collection of material for anybody who's really seriously we're trying to figure out what's going on. And we are open. I mean, in contrast to the governments, we are open. We are not hiding anything. Yeah. We are just, uh, of course, very sensitive about personal uh, items, of course, but uh, we are helping everyone every time as much as we can. Is the archives open right now? Are people with the COVID thing or, or do you have restrictions now or is it open to research? You know, just uh, yesterday, the Swedish government uh, said that all restrictions will be will be abandoned uh, in a week. Okay. So uh, we have been open to very small groups, to, to uh, single visitors, uh, all the all during the pandemic. But now, of course, this will be even better. So from next week, we are back into uh, business as usual, very much. And we have been very, very sensitive because we have people working at AFU that are in risk groups. Yeah, yeah. So um, we will still be cautious, I think, but uh, much more open now from next week. Wow. I, I'm going to have to make sure I, I make it down there because I, I just, as soon as I saw it, I said, oh man, I got to spend some time here because I was only there for a couple of hours. And, uh, and it took a couple of hours just to go through the rooms, through the collections. And it was just, <laughs> People just have no idea how much material uh, the archives has. Lastly, let me ask you a little bit about yourself. What's your personal story? Like why why UFOs, why paranormal? Uh, have you had your own experiences? And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, nowadays it's a long story. <laughs> it's been longer <laughs> and longer. <laughs> I started to get interested in UFOs in the late 1960s. Okay. Uh, I'm born 1958. And when I was 16, I started a UFO group in uh, my hometown in the south of Sweden. Yeah. And yeah. from that day, I spent uh, hours every day trying to understand what lies behind the UFO mystery. And to me, I don't have the answers. Uh, I, I don't say that. But I have lots of questions that are still unanswered. And uh, I really, I really burning to try to find the solutions. Uh, I'm investigating UFO cases every week. I'm a very, very prolific investigator. I think I may be investigating 50, 50 cases a year, something like that, yeah. personally. So, I mean, the, the paranormal has always been a part of my life as well, since I was a little boy. I, I read Eric von Daniken's books. Okay. Uh, and uh, when I grew up, I met with Eric von Däniken. I made an interview with him in Switzerland. I tried to cover my tracks really back to see if was this really as I as I hoped when I was young. Uh, and I've seen I've seen a thing in the sky that is very strange. Uh, in 1995, I was traveling uh, uh, in a car with my wife. We were just approaching our home here in uh, outside Stockholm. It was in November the 5th, uh, one o'clock in the night. And uh, suddenly when we approached uh, a bus stop, two men were standing there and one of them were pointing up in the sky. And the other one was looking. So I said to my wife, can you see what they are looking at? So she bent forward and she said, no, it's just a fantastic sky, stars everywhere. It's a wonderful night sky. Yeah. So we passed the men and uh, we were very near our house. So we parked the car and we went outside the car and I thought, I will probably see what they were looking at. I will probably see what they were misinterpreting as well. Uh, we're standing there for a couple of minutes, did see nothing at all. But suddenly, out of the darkness, up in the sky really, not from the horizon, came three illuminated plus signs like wow. this. Flying out of the darkness and flying over us. Uh, rigid, no flaps, no movement, just floating over us. And I ran across uh, uh, around the corner and I saw them flying over our neighbor's house and then vanished uh, with, over the horizon. And uh, we went inside in the middle of the night and took out this uh, form which UFO Sweden uses to, to fill out uh, UFO observations. We didn't 
<clears throat> exchange a word. We just say, now we do this by ourselves. Set that in separate rooms, filled the form out, made our drawings, and then after that, we compared. So uh, we don't understand what we saw really. And we, I put an investigator from UFO Sweden into this, trying to find an explanation. We didn't, we didn't find any. In terms of the, the paranormal stuff, you've got these other collections. Do you think that there is sort of an underlying connection between all this material, whether it be you know, physical mediums or mediums or ghosts, paranormal, UFOs? Do you think it's, it, there's an underlying connection to all this material? I think you must be very open to that there could be connections, at least. Um, very much of the UFO phenomena are um, physical, but lots of it are very much non-physical as well. Um, so I, I, I don't shut that door. I think you must be open-minded, but look at the evidence all the time. But you must be open to discussing this, and you must be open to researching this. Yeah. So it may be that all this fortune stuff is intertwined in some way, connected to each other. Okay. Is there anything that, that you would like to bring up that I haven't asked that uh, you think is significant that people should know about the archives and what you guys are doing there? I think it's important to think that you are not going to live forever and what will happen after your demise with your collections. Uh, because we do this of, out of respect for the researchers' work, a lifetime often put into the paranormal, the UFOs. And we really would love to save this for posterity and to make it available for researchers all around the world. So if you don't mind, put something in your will that this could go to AFU in the end. We are taking very, very well care of everything on this. And uh, we are so respectful. We do know how much work people are putting into this. So don't waste it. Beautiful. I, I will help you in that mission because um, I've said the same thing to people. Uh, to me, I always talk about it as being the Super Bowl or the World Cup of all stories and that you got to play in the game and you should record it and you should make sure that it, it gets saved for future generations because uh, it is a very important story and I really appreciate what the uh, archives is doing and uh, I, I can't say enough good things. I've been there, I can highly recommend it. And you can just see the, the, the quality of the, the way you file stuff. It's all very carefully done and um, just uh, an amazing job which people couldn't do for themselves. And anybody who's a uh, researcher, uh, I think it's worth the time and the money to go and to, to see what you guys have got. You'll just be absolutely floored by um, the material that you're going to get that you're not going to get anywhere else. Klaus, thank you for joining me and maybe we can do it again once you get the Canadian collection. We can maybe just talk about the Canadian collection for a few minutes because yeah. uh, that's something I'll be coming to see because there's, uh, uh, for example, the one case that um, uh, I'm very interested that has got to be in that collection is you talked about metals. Um, that the phenomena seems to do all sorts of strange things that I call it the theory of wow, where they just do these weird things where everybody's going like, what's going on? And they're just trying to get you to think that it's not the world you think it is. And there was some cases that happened in Canada in the 1950s. And I tried to track through Canadian researchers and that was where they were taking big pieces of dirt. I don't know if you know the story, but it must be in one of those collections where 15, foot, uh, 15 feet on a side, a foot deep and these pieces of earth that were lifted in one piece and like triangles and moved across in Ontario in about 1975, 76. That's when I started. And that's the kind of stuff that um, you guys would have the answer to where I would come just to look at that one, that one piece of material because very, very unique material. And it's gotta be in your collection where I spent years trying to find that material. I could not find who had those, those photographs and stuff like that. Okay, I know about uh, what they're talking about, ah. and uh, that kind of uh, phenomenon is called uh, earth throw, yield cast in Swedish, and that is, uh, I, have, I have many reports that are like what you're describing now. I've written a book about uh, usual natural phenomena and uh, earth throw 
this uh, one full chapter there. Wow. Well, what's the name of that book? Because I want, I would like to, I, I would like to follow up on that because that's that's part of the weird stuff that I look at in terms of putting all these things together. Yeah, it's. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. <clears throat> it's uh, well, it's about. Uh, it's in Swedish. I'm sorry to say. Oh, okay. So that, that wouldn't help you really, but um, I have many, many pictures of, of uh, Earth being uh, moved like that uh, from Sweden, from wow. uh, Europe, uh, from US as well. Uh, so this is something that I have focused on for for many years. I, I know a lot about this. Wow, you see that there? I've learned something today. I mean, that was that. That's a phenomenon that I mean, you think UFOs is strange. When you take a look at how you're able to do this, there's absolutely no way any sort of uh, human person could do that. I mean, it's just beyond anything. And it's just this weird sort of stuff. It's sort of like you just you just sit there and stare at it and go like, how did they do this? I mean, it, the last time it happened in Sweden was in 1903. Wow. That is very much uh, well documented with pictures and uh, a science report from a researcher traveling from Stockholm to, to the place of origin. Wow, fantastic. Thank you, Klaus. I really appreciate your time. I know you're you're very busy. We had to arrange this interview and um, I'll be in contact with you with um, particularly this one collection that she wants it saved. And I they're actually putting it all together now, the, the files and the audios and the books and stuff. And um, I think for now, it is the first uh, sort of abduction case that occurred in the United States. It was very well documented. The, the girl uh, did her own investigation, got all the police officers that were involved and, and uh, did, is doing a wonderful job trying to put this together and actually doing a Broadway musical. So between oh. those people, they're putting all this material together. And again, it's a collection where uh, her family is really not interested in the phenomena. They, they couldn't care less. And it's, uh, it may be a very historic case that uh, people should uh, have the material to, to access. So uh, I'll do that and I'll make sure that uh, my collection gets to you guys and uh, I'll encourage other people to send it uh, to you. Or in, in some cases, if they've got a catalog, they can actually send it to a couple places at the same time. Like you can do it to yeah. Rice and here, is, but you have to do a lot of work to get it ready to, um, to shift. But uh, if there's one place that it should go, it should go to you guys because you have the vast majority of, of collections that I've that at, uh, that are around, and and then people only have to go to one place, and uh, all the material is there. Although you would have to spend, I would say, you know, if you're going to do a half decent job on something, you could spend like months at your place in looking at material. Absolutely, and thank you for your good work, Grant, as well. And you're very welcome back to visit AFU. Anytime. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, when we get there, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat and you can uh, show me. I'll just ask you, because you seem to have a very clear knowledge. I'll say, okay, I'm looking at this and then you can just take me to whatever room it is and where it yeah. is and, uh, and, and help me out. Thanks okay. again. And I appreciate your time and absolutely appreciate what you guys are doing. Uh, if it weren't for uh, Pia in, in, um, in uh, okay. Denmark, I would never have known about it because I was going to Denmark and she said, you want to go see it? And I went, what is this? I, did, I had no idea it existed. And I've been in ufology since 1975. And like you, I probably spent a couple of hours every day since 1975 looking into this. So, it's, uh, you know, I, I thought I knew a lot, but um, you, you don't know anything until you've been to your archives. So thank you very much. Yeah. OK. Thank you, Grant. Thank you so yeah. much. OK. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Hang out with you.